right, let's turn to the book of Mark, chapter number nine, is where we're going to spend our time of preaching today. Mark, chapter number nine. The lectionary passage is verses 38 through 50, but in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, start out at verse number 41. Uh, it's worth saying, just by way of background, for uh, some who may not have the appreciation of the historical uh, significance of the book of Mark. Mark is considered to be the first gospel that was uh, put uh, to paper or to oral tradition. Uh, it is thought to have been uh, the eyewitness accounts um, and reflections of uh, the Apostle Peter. Mark was uh, the Apostle Peter's uh, protege, his Grio, or I'm sorry, his uh, uh, writer, if you will, uh, the one that he uh, traveled with. And so uh, Mark uh, is thought to have had his gospel circulating to the churches, mostly in the Roman Empire, uh, almost about 30 years or so after the death of Jesus, which means that uh, the significance of uh, this particular letter, as, as well as the other gospel writings, is that what they wrote down, many people who were alive to both uh, have seen Jesus and have heard the continuous reflections of this gospel writer uh, had the ability to verify or to claim these uh, stories to be not true. And it goes to uh, this point about why I think uh, the veracity and the historicity of the, the narrative of Jesus is so significant to us uh, because as we know, uh, we know what Jesus did because there were people around to bear witness to that uh, experience. And likewise, we are people who are living out the gospel in many times foreign places, uh, spaces and experiences that are not always comfortable to us. They are not the 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 designated spaces where uh, the, the reflection, the testimony, the witness of God is often affirmed. How many of you have been in places where uh, people uh, very much attempt to push back on that which you hold to be true? Uh, that our belief systems are not always taken with the kind of care or the kind of of deference as we would like. And so what is significant about this letter, I find, is that as Mark writes, as Mark captures, Mark is putting it out there so there were all, would always be a witness to the work and the life of Jesus. Mark did not see his gospel to uh, uh, necessitate uh, forcing folks to believe. Mark felt his responsibility was to put it out there so folks who were looking for the gospel could believe. And I want to tell you and I today in a time where uh, fact and fiction has been blurred and truth and falsity certainly has been commingled, uh, sometimes we spend much of our, our precious energy trying to convince folk of that which often uh, only God can change their mind. But we are still called to put it out there. Amen. And that is, I hope, what we see our assignment is as it relates to our public witness, uh, our, our influence among those whom God places around us. We are to bear witness to the truth and let the truth do the work. Amen. Amen. You ought to say that. I'm here to bear witness and let the truth do the work. Amen. Uh, the truth can work all on its own. I think I got a witness in here today that, that, that said the truth done worked on me a few times. Uh-huh. There are a few things I didn't want to know, and the truth came and found me and made a believer out of me. And so the book of Mark uh, is uh, the first gospel that was put out into the uh, literal ecosystem of a pagan uh, empire uh, called the Roman Empire, and it is in this uh, regard that we come to the text. Verse number 41, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And Jesus says, uh, verse number 41, for truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water, Ooh, thank you, Jesus, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose their reward. And if any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, 
it would be better for you if a great milestone were hung around your neck and were thrown into the sea. Verse number 43. So if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. Lord, have mercy. Jesus saying, I'm, I, you need to do some operation to yourself. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. Verse 47, and if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. And everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. Whew, the word of God for us, the people of God, what is let us say thanks be to God. Amen. Thanks be to God. Uh, we're going to uh, preach from the top for a few moments. Why are you so salty? Why are you so salty? Amen. 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 See, like some of y'all have been wrestling with that question before we got to church today. Amen. Come on, let's pray. God, we want to say thank you. Thank you for the word of God that has been read for the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you and let the anointing of God that makes preaching and teaching easy may rest on me and even the hearers of your word. We'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Why are you so salty? Now, you know, uh, I am uh, certainly one of these uh, folk who believe that the the primary role of the church in the world is to continue to proclaim the good news of a loving God to a people who are often looking for love in all the wrong places. We are to bear witness that Jesus has come to usher in a whole new way of life and existence, a new way of life that uh, is spiritual in nature, that is physical and material in impact, that has the ability to transform our emotional, psychological, and relational uh, realities. That the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is not something that uh, does not land in the materiality of our everyday lives. That the gospel seeks to permeate, penetrate, uh, dare I say, invade those places that are in need of influence, divine influence, sacred uh, influence. Um, and that we and you and I, as God's arms and legs in the world, are often put into places and spaces uh, to bear out the witness of the gospel. Uh, it is not lost on me as I read this passage that there are so many contradictions to those who name the name of Christ and those who read the scriptural text and the ideals purported in scripture and the ways in which our human social relationships bear these realities out. I, I, I'm not going to spend too much time on uh, what does it look to lose your saltiness because I've tried to commit myself to preaching from an asset frame. Amen. I want to be someone who offers some positive uh, introductions into our lives. But I have been struck over the last several weeks uh, that there is a expression of a salty less gospel. A gospel that has lost its saltiness. A way of life that has lost its saltiness. 
um, a, 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 a way of social relationships and arrangements that have lost their saltiness. Several weeks I, ago, I was in uh, Oklahoma and was there with uh, Reverend C.C. Jones Davis and the Justice for Julius campaign attempting to help uh, make this convincing public argument about the uh, innocence or at least the doubt of uh, the conviction, the death row conviction of Julius Jones, an uh, African-American young man uh, who was convicted of killing uh, an Oklahoma businessman some 22 years ago. And, 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 and so many uh, con contradictory things in this case. Uh, but what struck me the most as I spent time there was Oklahoma is considered to be the Bible Belt. It is a place where people seem to be uh, drunk on this idea of what it means to be Christian. But their drunkenness on their notion of Christianity did not allow or afford them the opportunity to see that their bloodthirsty need to kill a man. I would say whether he was guilty or not shows me that we have some expressions of Christian faith that have lost their saltiness. I was uh, just this week uh, down in Del Rio, Texas on the border after seeing those horrific, uh, horrific images of uh, Haitian migrants being cattled and kettled by uh, our tax paying border security agents uh, using their whips to uh, terrorize, terrify, intimidate, and control the bodies of Haitian migrants who uh, literally waded across the lowest part of the Rio Grande so they could uh, perhaps find asylum in the United States of America. And they were not met with compassion, but they were met with brute force and violence. And as we spent our time there for 48 hours or so, uh, I was struck by the kinds of people we were talking to. Some uh, were the NGOs who were very much Christian people who were receiving the Haitian uh, asylum seekers as they were being processed through the Border Patrol and ICE uh, uh, apparatus. And their compassion for them was admirable. Uh, the kind of treatment that they were extending to these exhausted uh, Haitian loved ones uh, brought tears to my eyes. And yet I realized as we engaged with some of them that for Many of them, children, teenagers, mothers, fathers, even some individuals who were single adult males, as they called them. That was their first act of compassion that they had received in literally a week. And it made me think as I talked to one of the pastors, he was attempting to defend the the, the, the brutality of the Border Patrol agents by just saying, you know, we are called to minister to them as well. And I thought to myself, what kind of perversion have we done with the gospel where we will make uh, the ministry to the oppressor a higher priority than the prophetic call out of their wicked behavior as to not offend somebody, as I was told. I, 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 I cannot help but ask myself, God, has our gospel lost its saltiness? Uh, I, I, I stood there and we heard such mind-numbing numbers, 400 Haitian migrants showed up on September 4th or 5th, and by a week later, that number has swelled to over 16,000. 
they showed up at this particular entry point because it was becoming known that the cartels in Mexico had uh, laid siege to many other paths to the United States. And there literally are smugglers there who are uh, asking for uh, the life savings of the migrants, uh, making them false promises that they can help get them into this country. And so these migrants are making a walk from Guatemala and Chile through the countries of Mexico, dodging Mexican cartels. And when they get to the border, they must now contend with, I will say, racist and anti-black border patrol agents who know that their journey is rough, but they are more concerned, as one agent told me, with their illegal entry into this country. And I began to ask myself, particularly after the agent said, I made an oath to uphold the Constitution. And I asked her, did you make an oath to follow Jesus as well? Because there comes a moment in our life where, as Dr. King says, it is our duty to disobey an unjust law. And if we are people who follow the ways of Jesus and find ourselves integrating into systems that lack compassion and our role in that system is to not uh, overturn the compassionless expression of that system that literally is fueled by our resources, then I want to suggest to you that we have lost our saltiness. I can go on and on. I can talk about voting rights and how we have a, a assault on our right to vote, but there seems to not be the the, 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 the saltiness in the follower of Jesus in America to make sure discrimination is not encoded in the laws of this land. I can talk about the ways in which uh, we have lost police reform all of a sudden and, and the ways in which uh, the COVID uh, crisis is continuing to, to be crippled and, 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 and sabotaged by the disinformation and misinformation of, of, of anti-vaxxers and, 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 and folks seized by uh, vaccine hesitancy. All of these things, child of God, in a moment like this, requires you to be salty, to be a follower of Jesus that maintains its saltiness. I mean, what is it about the way we have been discipled in the world, in this country, that we can be a part of the church but have compassion deficits when it comes to parts of God's creation? Social media exposes this compassion deficit, but it does not resolve it. Our culture reflects compassion deficits, but it does not provide alternatives. And if I could boldly say churches speak loud and clear at times about compassion deficits, but our responses are still too anemic. One of the most powerful themes of the ministry of Jesus was for us to be salt and light. If you recall in the, the, the synoptic gospel uh, uh, in the book of Mark chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 5, while Jesus was on the Sermon on the Mount, he talked about that we are called to be a light like a lamp set on a hill, a city on a hill that shines right? That our influence ought to be beyond ourselves, uh, and it ought to impact ourselves. That it is not an either or, but it is and must always be a both and. And the church, as I reflected on my journey to the border and uh, going back to San Antonio, and, and we were dropping folks off at different places, I was uh, wonderfully 
blessed by the, the idea that many of the places we were dropping individuals off were at churches. But I was also a bit dismayed that many of these churches did not reflect the, the racial or demographic of those who were indeed needing to be received. Many did not speak the language of Creole. They did not speak the language of the Honduran, the Chilean, or the Mexican populations. And so the kind of various challenges related to communication were literally jumping through the kind of experiences that we beheld. And it made me ask myself and think about the Underground Railroad uh, of, of, the, of the antebellum slavery times and how the churches were often used as stations throughout the South to the North. Not every church signed up for it because it was quite risky. Not everybody wanted to put themselves on the line in that way. But there was this common understanding that uh, houses of worship needed to be more than just a place of spiritual refuge, that there needed to be a material consequence to how the houses of worship were leveraged. And I, I do believe that these buildings we have, they do not belong to us in this time. But we are sitting in buildings that belong to our ancestors. We are a part of a body that is eternal in nature and timeless in mission. That we are caretakers. Somebody say caretaker. I'm a caretaker. We are a caretaker and a steward of these buildings and ministries and businesses and, and, and organizations that when put together, we can literally uh, attend to the well-being of those in need of healing, liberation, and opportunity. And child of God, I want you to know that one of our tasks as a church, as a follower of Jesus, is to ensure that we remain salty, we remain functional, we remain reflective of what God's mission to us is in the world. I'm not hating on you that chase your money, but I want you to know you can chase money all you want. But if you chase money without mission, you will lose your saltiness. If you chase position without uh, uh, ethics and integrity, you will lose your saltiness. If you follow Jesus but are not willing to face your bias and prejudice against those you do not like, you will lose your saltiness. If you are someone who cannot bring your temper or your anger or your predilection to hitting and harming, you will lose your saltiness. And I'm here to tell you, you must stay salty. Amen. You cannot allow yourself to be salty less. Because another passage says, if you lose your saltiness, you are good for nothing but to be thrown into the fire. Amen. Tell your neighbor, I got to stay out of that fire. Amen. I, 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 now, we're going to talk about the kind of useful fire. But how many of you know there is a fire that you don't want any part of? Lord, I feel like talking about that, but I won't today. Amen. Ask your neighbor, why are you so salty this morning? Amen. Now, now I, 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 I think when I come to the scriptures, verse uh, number 42, uh, I do find uh, the first answer to this question to be uh, a little, I'm going to try to uh, make a, 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 a point I've not made before as I was kind of doing some reading and studying this week uh, about this one point. So the first reason or the first way that we remain salty is to focus on addition by subtraction. Amen. Addition by subtraction. Verse number 43 says that if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. If your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. Amen. 
Uh, now, you know, I don't want you to, to, to take this too literally. Amen. But if you do need some amputation services in your body, you ought to go to the doctor. Amen. Don't do it at home. I know everything's virtual these days. <laughs> Amen. But don't, 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 don't go overboard. But, but I will say to you that addition by subtraction is often a key to us remaining salty because there are often many things that we uh, pick up in our lives during the course of our lives that literally are erasing the image of God in you. Uh huh. There are experiences that we have in our lives that are literally erasing our capacity to see the image of God in other people. Now, you and I are often unaware of these kinds of realities until you bump up against something that causes a stumbling block for somebody else. Now, if I was only around everybody I liked, I would never understand that I could be a stumbling block for someone else. Uh huh. But there are times when I get around folk who don't look like me, who don't share my same affinities, who have a different reading of life and experience. And it is in those times that I begin to understand not everybody likes the chicken the way I like it. Not everybody likes my sports team. Not everybody shares my political ideology. Not everybody has my cultural background. Not everybody uh, loves what I love. And it is in that moment of friction that I begin to contend with what does it mean for me to not become a stumbling block for God's precious people. I want you to know, child of God, that you and I must become much more conscious about the ways in which we are stumbling blocks to other people. Now, this becomes a very hard teaching, and I think that's why Jesus, uh, you know, often left people shaking their head and walking away. I mean, I like Jesus when he, you know, you know, giving out free fish sandwiches, praise God. When he's healing the sick and raising the dead. Oh, I love that kind of Jesus. But when Jesus starts talking to me about my hand, my foot, and my eye. Oh, then Jesus, you know, you're not talking to me. But you're sure enough talking to him over there because I know about his feet. <laughs> I know about his hands. I know about his eye. But when it comes to your foot and your hand and your eye, you seem to not have any consciousness. Lord, I, what am I talking about in here today? Uh huh. Addition by subtraction is about you and I having some honest conversations with ourselves and with those who are different from us and finding out is there a way for us to reason together it need not require us to agree on everything but it should cause you and i to have compassion for one another yes th this message around saltiness is about compassion today it is about how do we evoke compassion for the other? How do we allow the salt that we are called to uh, uh, hold on to, to reflect, to become a source of compassion for ourselves, for our families, for our neighbors, for those whom we know and don't know? And I want you to know that the most stirring part of this text is when it starts to talk about the consequence of if you do not cut off that which causes you or your neighbor to stumble. Now, you know, I grew up in the Holiness Pentecostal Church. Uh, I mean, the Apostolic Holiness Pentecostal Church, which is probably the most, you know, stringent, conservative, legalistic form of Zion in America. Although I was on a webinar with some Pentecostal bishops this week uh, doing a panel, and I think I met someone who was more uh -huh, 
conservative than we were. <laughs> Amen. And it brought me back. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. Let me come on back. Amen. Uh, and, 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 you know, so whenever I read about hell in Scripture, I automatically assumed that it was talking about an eternal place of torment and, to and torture that was a result of the sin in our lives that was left unrepentant and the salvation that we did not access through Jesus. And so whenever I talked or read about hell, I just assumed that that's what they were talking about. But I do recall reading about how the early and ancient Jewish uh, people did not have a sense of eternal punishment. Uh, that they were not uh, even, you know, imagining that, that uh, the afterlife would be, be about eternal torment that they believed that the body and the soul were one and when the body died your existence ended and so as I you know began to think a little bit about this passage and think about Jesus who was a Jew through and through although he was God and he had a sense of eternity it made me think a little bit about what Jesus was actually trying to communicate to his disciples when he talked about addition by subtraction. I think Jesus is saying actually that what is at stake is not necessarily your eternal state of being. But he's talking about the kind of state of being we are creating now. When we are not able to create societies that do not have stumbling blocks for people and creation. That as a point of fact, Jesus is saying that uh, hell as a state of being is just as problematic as an eternal place of torment. That the stumbling blocks that we do not remove from people's pathways actually create a perpetual state of suffering in this present life. And we are called then to examine the ways in which we are putting stumbling blocks in people's lives while they are alive today. Because if we put stumbling blocks in their lives, and what are stumbling blocks? Racism. What are stumbling blocks? Uh, uh, economic exploitation. What are stumbling blocks? Violence against women. What are stumbling blocks? Uh, transphobia, homophobia that leads to the dehumanization of God's creation. What are stumbling blocks? Not taking care of the environment. What are stumbling blocks? Uh, rape, murder. What are stumbling blocks? Cheating one another. What are stumbling blocks? Police brutality and white supremacy and misogyny and sexism I think Jesus is telling them if you don't remove those stumbling blocks uh, then you are creating a hell like reality for people right now and why is that important <laughs> Because in verse number 48, it says that the, these kinds of realities are places where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. That we who do not remove stumbling blocks create a perpetual state of suffering for God's people that ought not be on our watch. I want you to know, child of God, the question I want us to reckon with this morning, are we in danger? of creating hell on earth while we are so consumed with escaping hell in eternity lord i hope you understand what i'm saying today you and i must ensure that not in our name can someone say i follow jesus and use a horse's uh rain to whip a child of god not in my name can you claim i'm pro-life but you terrorize the mothers who can't figure out along the way how to take care of the family they already have not in my name can you claim that i follow
follow Jesus, but I hate who Jesus loves. The devil is a lie. You need some addition by subtraction. Lord, help me to preach to somebody today. So, so the question is, what are the stumbling blocks we are in danger of being in the world? What must we cut off so we can have room to add? What must I cut out of my life so God can add things into my life? God, help me to lose the hatred I have for some of these folk uh, so you can inject some love in that space. Uh, help me to lose the selfishness, selfishness I have uh, so you can put in place concern for others. Uh, help me to lose the fear that I've picked up along the way uh, so you can put in my life uh, a kind of boldness uh, that keeps me salty uh, in the world where I'm called to live. Uh, some Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, the second thing that the scripture talks about is that your life is an offering. Somebody holler, my life is an offering. Now, verse number 49, it says that everyone will be salted with fire. Uh huh. He's saying, Pastor Mike, yeah, how, how did you get my life is an offering uh, out of everyone must be salted by fire? Well, you got to again understand that that Jesus is using language uh, that the reader and the hearer would understand and translate to a different meaning. Jesus talking about you will be salted with fire is a regular practice used in the Levitical law that prepares the gifts and the offerings being offered as a sacrifice to God that no offering can be given to God as a sacrifice unless it is salted with fire Lord have mercy you missed that yeah uh -huh. it's saying the fact that you must be salted with fire means that God sees your life as an offering you are an oblation you are a, a, a form of sacrifice to God Romans chapter number 12 says I beseech you I beg you I, 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 I am asking you to present your body as a living sacrifice holy which means set apart unto God which is your reasonable service your body somebody say my body he did not say your soul. He did not say your spirit. He said your body, which means uh, that part of your saltiness is about the extent to which you can present your body as a sacrifice uh, that can be salted, that can be prepared, uh, that can be cured, if you will. Uh, so God can get some glory out of your life. Uh, Lord, I wonder, do you hear how God is trying to get some glory out of somebody today? Yeah. You think that your life is going through salty fire because you are uh, uh, you're doing something that is against what God has asked you to do. <laughs> but I hear God saying, no, you are going through salty fire because I see you as a gift. There is an intrinsic value to your life, child of God. There is an intrinsic worth to your life. You and others may not believe the extent of your value just yet, but every day you ought to wake up and say, I am an offering to God. I have been set apart. They may not see my value, but I'm glad God sees my value. They may not believe Black Lives Matter, but it don't matter because God knew before you figured it out uh, that my life has value uh, they may try to diminish you because of your gender that's okay because God did not reduce you uh, because of your sex uh, because of your orientation your class uh, God sees you as an offering to him and how many of you know if my life is an offering to God there's not a whole lot of people 
I need to try to please. But my life must be pleasing to the one who I am being offered to. And so the salt is used to season me. The salt is used to preserve that which need not die out just yet. The salt is used to provide a little bit of, you know, extra flavor in your ear. Uh huh. The salt is necessary. So you do not be, you know, like, you know, I don't want to hate on nobody. Your auntie who don't know how, don't know how to make potato salad. Uh huh. Uh huh. How many of you know sometimes you go to family meetings uh, and, you know, they come with they, 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 they best dish, but they always seem to take leftovers back home with them. It's because they don't know how to use flavor. They don't know how to use seasoning. Mm -hmm. I hope I'm not talking about nobody in the virtual church today. I, but I do want you to know that when you are an offering to God, you will go through testing. You will go through trial, but it is not meant to kill you, but it is meant to pull out of you all of the things that have been put in you. It is to refine you. So when you show up to a battle, when you come through a trial, you have a different testimony on the other side. Do I have a witness that can say I got a testimony of how God? God brought me through and when he brought me through uh, this joy that I have uh, I didn't get it from UC Berkeley uh, this wisdom that I got it didn't come from Stanford uh, this intellect I have uh, it didn't come from you know I don't know uh, Socrates uh, but it came from the salty fire of the Lord uh, he changed me uh, he redeemed me uh, he made me brand new uh, somebody holler out there Thank God for salty fire uh, because I am an offering. Uh, so here's the question. What kind of offering is God making your life to be as you're being tested? Uh, are you conscious that even though I'm going through it, uh, I'm still an offering? Uh, even when I sin and mess up or do the wrong thing, uh, God, your salty fire is going to make sure I end up in the right place uh, because my life is an offering offering uh, last thing that i'll say uh, about the scripture verse number 50 it says salt is good but if salt loses its saltiness how can you season a thing uh, have salt in yourselves uh, and be at peace with one another uh, uh, the last thing child uh, of God I'll tell you stay salty uh, don't lose your saltiness uh, but stay salty uh, stay on the path of influence uh, be someone who has the power to leverage your influence in your circles uh, of concern uh, ask yourself will I be a source of light uh, love and truth uh, or will I be the black hole when I come into the room uh, you know what a black hole is uh, it's not a disparagement on the the, the phenotype uh, of black bodies no the black hole uh, is when uh, gravity becomes so so heavy in in space that it literally sucks light into it uh, rather than the sun that emanates light you can stay salty by ensuring that when i show up into a room i am a source of light oh uh, hello soul development i don't know Kariga lauren fee uh-huh i want you to know that when i step into a room light follows me light is with me the power of God is with me and I may not have a lot of money but I got a lot of salt I may not have a lot of power but I have a lot of salt Martin Luther King he said it like this are you a thermometer or are you a thermostat are you somebody that only measures the, the temperature in the room so when you come into the room you are literally like a chameleon being uh, sucked into the culture the sensibilities of that room are you a thermostat which means that I 
when I show up, I have the power through the Holy Ghost, through the disciplines of my faith, through the wisdom of the ancestors, because I've studied to show myself approved unto God. I show up and I can literally, like a thermostat, change the tenor of a room. I change the tenor in my family. I change the tenor with my children. I change the tenor in my neighborhood. I change the tenor in my political work. I change the tenor in my schoolhouse. I change the tenor with the young people on the block. I change the tenor in my family because I got some salt that does not come from my own source, but it comes from the power of the living God. And I believe God's looking for some salty folks today. God's looking for a few folks uh, who's willing to say I'm salty uh, and I'm not going to go nowhere. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to be like the scripture says. Uh, I'm going to have a lot of salt in my life. Uh, I'm going to have a lot of influence in my life. Uh, I'm going to exude compassion. Uh, I'm going to give out love. Uh, I'm going to give out peace and joy. Uh, I'm not going to be the black hole uh, that's taken from you and you and you that I don't like but if somebody shows up in my life God may the saltiness of my being Lord may me may I be a source of light a source of strength a source of hope for them so I can be salty that's it y'all somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah I you we must be salty and I want you, child of God, to, 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 to see your life as a expression of compassion and impact. There's all kind of ways we could follow Jesus or at least try to in this world. Some of us have been shaped and formed to follow Jesus by trying to preach the hell out of people rather than call forth the divinity that's within the people. Oh, how many know we are created in the image of God? Amen. There's more to you than the hell that I see. Just like there's more to me than the hell you see. And if God can see the divine in me, Athanasius says it, or Nisa, Gregory of Nyssa from the fourth century said that God became human so humans can become divine we are all in a process of becoming like God how many of you know if I can pull out the divinity in you oh addition by subtraction will become a reality I don't have to preach things out of you when all I need to do is call the divine forward that's what we're trying to do with these young men in the neighborhoods Everybody sees them as killers, but some of us, we see them as protectors. We got to call that out of them. Some of our loved ones who are caught in the, the, the grips of misinformation. You know, I was talking with one loved one. He said something so profound to me. He said, you know, Mike, suspicion of the government is literally what has kept black folk alive <laughs> so you know some of these folk are using a they're using a, 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 a survival technique that has worked for hundreds of years so our job is not to make them feel terrible about it but it is to call forth whew, the wisdom of the ages that can help them see life and healing and possibility in the midst of hellish like conditions. Lord, help me to remove stumbling blocks. Help me, God, to, to be conscious of the ways I show up in the world. Help me not to be a bull in a china shop all the time. Help me, God, to know that I'm surrounded by people who may not always share my experiences and thoughts and ideas. But God, I do believe 
that my saltiness can make a profound impact. So God, make me salty. Keep me salty. May my saltiness remain. We who are gathering today, God, are often moving through experiences where the test is feeling like it's about to break us. We can't see that the test is actually a recognition that God, we are an offering to you. Not because of some saddle, uh, modistic manner, but God, we, we acknowledge Lord that there's some things that you want to, that you know life must prepare and work out of us. And so I pray, God, we that are losing heart, we that are going through these difficult moments and seasons, give us what we need, Lord. Give us strength. Give us hope. Give us peace and power. Bless every person that is here in this virtual worship service today meet them in their home meet them in their relationships on their jobs in their neighborhoods meet them at the point of their need may lord god compassion pour out of the people of god without limit forgive us lord god for our shortcomings somebody say lord i'm sorry help us to repent and make some u-turns help us to go in some other directions help us lord who work in these systems to not lord become compassionless to lose our salt while we are in these systems but may we god become even the more salty save us somebody say save me lord heal us somebody say heal me lord deliver us somebody say deliver me lord keep us somebody say keep me lord do what you will have thine own way and we will bless you in jesus name we pray let the people of god say amen uh give your neighbor a high five virtually tell them that's why you so salty amen that's why you are so salty god bless you people of the way we love you so much with the love of the lord 